works. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is the first in our series of three conversations about changes to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act with the goal of protecting vulnerable populations from hazardous chemicals. And today's topic is timely change and need, justifying and adopting environmental rights in Canadian environmental law. My name is April Weppler, and I'm the engagement coordinator here at the Canadian Environmental Law Association, or CELA. And also on the call with us today is my colleague, Faye DeLeon, who is a researcher and paralegal with CELA, and also the master organizer for our webinar today. I will introduce all of our speakers in just a moment. I'm going to reverse my usual order and actually start with my housekeeping um, for those who might be new to Zoom or unfamiliar with the particular platform we're using today. So we are hosting this conversation in Zoom meeting as opposed to the webinars that you might be used to joining with us. And we've done that to try and allow um, a bit more discussion amongst uh, everyone on the call, which we'll do after our presentations. So you'll notice that you do have the power to unmute yourself and turn your webcam on, but I would ask you not to use that. Um, if we have time in the discussion period at the end, we'll invite people to unmute their microphones and ask questions. But for now, keep yourself muted, keep your webcam turned off. We also have enabled the chat today. So you're welcome to drop a little hello note in the chat. If you'd like, tell us where you're coming from today. We are gonna be polling everybody about their location in a moment, but if you want to say hi, um, you're welcome to do that. And then also the chat is where you're going to pose all of your questions today. So if you have questions for our speakers during their presentations, put those in the chat at any time and we'll get to as many as we can in the discussion period at the end. All right, what else do I need to tell you about Zoom? I think that's it. For those who've been on our calls before, we often use the Q&A feature. We won't be using that today, so don't look for it. You can just use the chat. All right, so uh, with those logistics taken care of, we will continue to have people join over the next couple minutes, that's fine. Um, so before we talk more about our speakers in our webinar, I would like to acknowledge that I'm calling in today from Guelph, which is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabeg peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And our neighbors are the Six Nations of the Grand Watershed. For those who might not be familiar with CELA, we are a specialty legal clinic within the Ontario wide network of clinics funded by Legal Aid Ontario. And we work to protect human health and the environment by seeking justice for those harmed by pollution and by working to change policies to prevent such problems in the first place. Because we're a legal aid clinic, our top priority is to represent low income individuals and communities and to speak up for those with less influence and who have less of a say in decision making. Our work for environmental law protection and reform is fundamental to social justice because the people who are most impacted by air pollution, unsafe water, or contaminated land are often also the least able to avoid such threats. As a legal aid clinic, CELA is uniquely positioned to work with our sister clinics, service providers, uh, health partners, and educators to advance those reforms. This year, CELA is celebrating our 50th anniversary and we can't let down our guard. Environmental laws are under attack in Ontario and even the Ontario legal aid system itself has been threatened with ill-advised reform ideas over the last year. We hope you will want to stay engaged with CELA, pay attention to the issues, speak out for the most vulnerable among us, call for strong environmental protection laws and support our work. So we encourage you to have a look at our website, sign up for our newsletter, uh, and stay connected with us. We'll put all of those links in the chat in a few minutes. So I apologize if I seem a bit distracted. I'm just letting people in from the waiting room while I'm telling you about our webinar today. So I'd like to introduce our speakers on the line with us today. We have Ryan Shawner, who is a legal intern with CELA. We have Lisa Gyu, who is the senior researcher and analyst with David Suzuki Foundation. Hello. And we have Elaine McDonald, who is a program director for Healthy Communities with EcoJustice. Hi. And before I pass the mic over to Ryan, I just want to do a couple of quick polls and ask you a couple questions so we can get a better sense of who's on the line today. Uh, and just noticing, yeah, Peter, absolutely, thank you. If people want to introduce themselves in the chat, uh, let us know where you are today. Please feel free to do that. In the meantime, I'm gonna launch this first poll. Hopefully everyone can see that. We're inviting you to tell us what sector you represent. So if everybody wants to click on the sector that they represent, we'll get a sense of who's on the line. 
And as a side note, Faye, there's a very fun thing happening. All the people that you shared your link with to help them get into the webinar are now all appearing as Faye in the invite list. So there's about six of you in the invite list today. But, um, you might want to change. That's okay. It, and if people do know how to do that, you're welcome to change your name in the participant list. If not, if I figure out who you are as the webinar goes on, I can change the name for you. All right, let's show everybody. Not surprisingly, the vast majority of our attendees today are from NGOs. Also some academics and students joining us on the line, which is great. And always a few in the other category. We never capture everybody. All right, let's get our next poll question up here. Next, a fun take on the usual where are you located poll if you wanna tell us which watershed you're in today. And if you're not sure that's okay, we have an unsure category. And if you're not in one of the Great Lakes watersheds, you can also click on other. So I'll give everyone a few moments to answer there. A couple last votes still coming in. Okay, so as often is the case, Lake Ontario is the winner. A couple coming in from Lake Erie and Lake Huron, St. Lawrence as well, and then a few not within the Great Lakes watershed. And our last question, which is really to benefit our speakers today, is to give us a sense of how you would rate your knowledge about either environmental rights in Canada or the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. We'll just leave that up for a few more seconds. That's great. We've got someone from PEI on the line. Welcome, Toby. All right, let's put this back up. So most indicating somewhat knowledgeable. Somebody who's very knowledgeable might even be one of our speakers who answered. Who knows? <laughs> All right, with that, I am going to turn the virtual mic over to Ryan. So Ryan, if you would like to unmute yourself, I will stop screen sharing so that you can and you can get going. Great, thank you, April. Oops. Uh, so hello, I am Ryan Shawner, a legal intern with the Canadian Environmental Law Association. I am in the third year of the JD program at Osgoode Hall Law School, and I would like to thank Sila for this opportunity. Uh, I have worked with Sila since September of last year on researching avenues of reform for the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, and I'm grateful they asked me to participate in this webinar series. Uh, today I am presenting from Toronto and would like to acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today I will be talking to you about the right to a healthy environment, what it is, why it's important, and why Canada must recognize this right. To begin, what is the right to a healthy environment? First, it is an idea with a long history and widespread acceptance. Uh, globally, this right is recognized by 156 countries, leaving Canada as one of the 37 countries to not recognize it. Second, it is a human right underpinning, uh, that underpins and impacts other fundamental human rights the right to life, the right to health, and the right to an adequate standard of living all depend on healthy and safe environments for their full enjoyment. The water we sustain ourselves with, the food we consume, the air we breathe, and the plants and animals we share this planet with are all dependent on healthy and functioning ecosystems and ecological processes. Finally, and most importantly, the right to a healthy environment is an idea whose time is now. Recently, the UN Special Rapporteur on, the right, uh, on Human Rights and the Environment, uh, Canadian David Boyd, presented to both the UN Human Rights Council and the UN General Assembly 
um, their special rapporteur Boyd presented a letter signed by almost a thousand civil society groups from across the globe, uh, including the three that are represented here today. Uh, the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly will vote on these resolutions in 2021. But with the twin crises of the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, Canadians cannot wait for their government to catch up to the rest of the world. The protection of human rights, the protection of human health, and the protection of environmental health demand recognition of the right to a healthy environment. So earlier in 2020, Special Rapporteur Boyd released a report, uh, which I have linked to at the end of my presentation, that identifies common elements of recognized rights to a healthy environment. Um, there are three elements to this, uh, and I don't want to bore everyone with legal detail, but I thought I should mention these as something to keep in mind for Elaine's and Lisa's presentations, specifically on the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. So the first is legal recognition. This can be recognition of the right in the constitution. Uh, it can be in a separate piece of environmental legislation or it can be through a standalone bill of rights. Um, each of these will have different impacts. In Canada, options include recognition under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, either implied in existing rights or uh, expressly added through an amendment. Uh, it could be in recognition in an act like the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, or it could be through an environmental bill of rights, which have been proposed as private members bills in the past. Uh, the second element is procedural rights. Uh, and per, uh, Special Rapporteur Boyd identifies access to information, meaningful public participation, and access to justice as essential. Now, to some extent, SEPA does provide for these, but each of them could be strengthened under the Act. Uh, so the final element are the substantive rights, and these include the rights to clean air, safe water, uh, uh, a safe climate, healthy and sustainably produced food, safe water and adequate sanitation, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, and non-toxic environments. So with this in mind, let's turn our attention to what other countries have done with this right. So what can, uh, what can Canada learn from other jurisdictions? As I said earlier, uh, the right to a healthy environment is a widespread and long established idea. Portugal was the first nation to recognize this right in the constitution in 1976, which is six years before the passage of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, particularly good practices can be seen with the examples of three countries, Argentina, France, and Norway. So in Argentina, constitutionalization of the right led to other environmental laws at both the national and subnational levels, and the right provides for individuals and organizations to bring lawsuits when there have been violations of the right. In France, constitutionalization led to the right to a healthy environment being used as a unifying principle as there are a number of laws, regulations, and policies which recognize, protect, and implement the various procedural or substantive rights. Norway, like France, has constitutional recognition with separate legislation mandating access to environmental information and public participation. Um, from this, we can see that recognition of the right to a healthy environment is not the end, it is only the beginning, but there is a well-trod path for Canada to follow. The government of Canada does not have to look beyond its own borders for examples of recognized environmental rights. Some provinces and territories recognize the right to a healthy environment to some extent. Uh, Quebec's Environmental Quality Act was the first piece of legislation in Canada to recognize the right to a healthy environment in 1978. 
Uh, though one downside to Quebec's approach is that the rights are limited to the matters that are covered by the Act itself. Uh, Ontario's Environmental Bill of Rights was passed in 1993, and it recognizes the right to a healthful environment and the protection of that right. Uh, protection is achieved through a variety of expanded procedural rights, including participation in certain decisions and processes, uh, the creation of an environmental registry for notice about certain environmental matters, and then there are rights to request reviews of policies or acts, uh, to request investigation of potential contraventions of the right, and a right to sue for harm to public resources. Uh, the Yukon Environment Act provides broad environmental rights with one court noting that the rights there encourage full participation in environmental decisions. Uh, the federal government recognizing this right would extend it to everyone in Canada, not just those of us who happen to live in certain provinces. But why should the government do this? At the international level and here in Canada, a recognized environmental or a recognized right to a healthy environment leads to stronger environmental laws and policies, and it leads to better environmental outcomes like cleaner air, reduced exposures to toxics, and safer food and water. Recognition lays the groundwork for better uh, environmental governance. Uh, so environmental impacts in Canada disproportionately impact racialized and marginalized peoples. Throughout the country and in a myriad of ways, vulnerable populations are subject to heightened, uh, heightened pollution and environmental contamination. A right to a healthy environment gives such populations additional tools to demand justice and insist upon their rights both environmental and otherwise. Recognizing the right to a healthy environment will also help Canada meet its various international obligations around human rights generally and the environment specifically. Uh, Canada is a party to seven foundational United Nations human rights treaties, including the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Recognizing the right to a healthy environment will allow Canada to better fulfill these obligations. Recognition of this is also an important step in creating a circular economy. Now, more than ever, it is important to transition to a low carbon economy and reduce the generation of wastes and plastics that linger in the environment for a long time. The need to transition is mentioned by Canada in their recent discussion paper on the proposed single-use plastics ban under SEPA, and such a ban would only be strengthened if it is partnered with a right to a healthy environment. A focus on preventing pollution and exposures to toxics will also help reduce healthcare costs long term. In short, the right to a healthy environment will lead to better decisions about environmental matters that affect the daily lives of Canadians. We can see the necessity of recognizing the right to a healthy environment if we look at toxic impacts in Canada. Pollution and exposure to hazardous substances have disproportionate effects for vulnerable populations, and such vulnerabilities can be found along gendered lines, along racialized lines, along age lines, and along socioeconomic status. Women face disproportionate risks from substances commonly found in consumer products, such as cosmetics. Children's bodies are more likely to absorb toxic chemicals, and exposures at a young age can have lifelong consequences. Workers may face exposures to dangerously high levels of chemicals. Indigenous communities like Amjawanong near Sarnia or Grassy Narrows in Northern Ontario have faced decades of heightened exposures from nearby industrial facilities. Canada's import and export of hazardous wastes also raises human rights concerns. 
with less than 10% of plastic waste recycled in Canada, steps must be taken to both reduce the generation of waste domestically while minimizing its external impact. Canada cannot continue to ship wastes to countries in the global south like was done with the Philippines. More must be done at home to protect vulnerable peoples around the globe. So recognizing the right to a healthy environment will allow the government to make better decisions about chemicals and better protect the health of vulnerable populations. Uh, for additional information on the right to a healthy environment in Canada, there's a blog post on SELA's website that goes into more detail about what I have talked about. Uh, Elaine and Lisa will provide more context on SEPA and what uh, impact recognition of the right to a healthy environment may have for that act. So in conclusion, uh, recognizing a right to a healthy environment is necessary for protection of human rights. Recognizing this right would extend it to everyone in Canada. It would protect vulnerable populations. It would allow for more informed decisions about environmental matters and it will help build a low carbon circular economy for future generations. So there are some resources for when this is posted later. And thank you for listening. And thank you to Sila for giving me this opportunity. And with that, I will pass it over to our next presenter. Hi, everyone. Let me see if I can do this. Screen two. Oh, no, my presentation screen's not showing. Oh, there it is. Got it, I think. It's not showing yet, but maybe it's on its way. There we go. Okay. You we see it? it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I've lost my arrows. Like before, <laughs> what did I do wrong this time? And if it's really being, oh, there you go, you got it. I've got it. Oh, got you know it. what? I just need to click on the slides and it works. Okay. Perfect. I think I'm, am I going the wrong way? Yes. Start again. Uh oh. <laughs> That's okay. We just saw your whole presentation in fast forward mode. Oh my gosh. No problem. Sorry about this, guys. I actually, um, I'd open my presentation again. Yep, that's all right. Um, am I still showing my screen? You're not, no. For some reason, I don't see. I also have it up and ready to go, Elaine. So if you'd rather that I, I did make it, a I few switches to it, but yeah, I don't know what's going on. That when I open up, it seems to okay. Do you just go with your version? When I open it up, it seems to disappear. I don't know okay. why, and then I can't find it. Okay. And Excuse I had it working me. before. No problem. I Take apologize for being. That's okay. It happens. So let me just take one moment here to get the right thing up and showing. I know that's only a portion. We'll get it opened up for you there. Is that showing the right thing for everyone now? Should be. Sorry, Sorry about that. Be, that's okay. You can go okay, ahead. So, so um, with Ryan's introduction, well, I'm going to dig in a little bit more on why it makes sense to recognize the right to healthy environment under SEPA and why now is the time to do that. So you can go to the next slide. Just to give everyone a little bit of background on SEPA, um, in case you're not familiar with the Canadian Environmental Protection Act is, we de describe it as Canada's cornerstone piece of federal legislation for environmental and human health protection from pollution and toxics. Um, it's built on recognizing that the protection of the environment is essential to the well-being of Canadians, but it does stop short of recognizing the right to a healthy environment. 
Its stated primary purpose is respecting pollution prevention and the protection of the environment and human health in order to continue, in order to contribute to sustainable development. Uh, the, act, the act was originally enacted back in 1988 and it received a major overhaul in 1999. Um, and it, there was a review back in 2006, 2008. However, that review did not lead to any amendments to the act. So there's been no major changes to the act in over 20 years now, really. We, the act we're dealing with today is the 1999 version. So a lot has changed in 20 years and that's why um, we are pushing for amendments to SEPA. You can go to the next slide because I'll talk about what's happened in the last few years. So back in 2016, the uh, environment, the uh, House Standing Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development launched into a review of SEPA, which lasted for about 15 months. Uh, they heard from 56 witnesses, received 66 briefs. Um, I think all of the organizations that are presenting here today were involved in that review and presented briefs and appeared as witnesses. Um, coming out of that very comprehensive review was a um, 87 recommendations to strengthen SEPA, including recommendations with respect to recognizing the right to healthy environment, enhanced consideration of vulnerable populations. Um, the, the report uh, was also supported by the NDP who made further recommendations with respect to right to healthy environment and even the opposition report, which was conserved as recognized the need that's, that recognized that SEPA needed to be amended, although they didn't go as far as recognizing uh, the need for a right to healthy environment. So we really had all parties involved in that review, um, recognizing that there was, it was time for SEPA to be strengthened. Um, and of course the recommendations did very slightly. So then in response to the report in 2016, the Minister of the Environment, it was then Minister McKenna, who was the last government we're talking about, um, published a complete response to the committee's review, including introducing a bill and committed to introducing a bill to reform SEPA as soon as possible in the future parliament, which is the parliament we're in now. Um, we were really, at the time, of course, we were really hopeful that we could get a bill in that parliament. However, the government was pretty bogged down with existing bills that were, they were trying to get through the House, including the, the bill with, that was amending the uh, Canadian Environmental Protect, uh, Canadian Assessment Act, the Impact Assessment Act. Um, so basically the response was, you'll have to wait. <laughs> so now we're in that parliament. And in 2019, when the government uh, got back into power, the mandate letters to the Minister of Health and Environment Climate Change uh, stated that they are to, to they are to must work together to better protect people and the environment from toxins and other pollution, including strengthening the Canadian Environment Protection Act. So there we have a mandate commitment to SEPA reform. And then just recently, a few weeks ago, uh, after prorogue, when the government came back and uh, the speech from the throne, they once again reiterated their commitment to uh, modernize SEPA. And the, the the picture you're seeing here is the is just the front page of the. Uh, the committee's uh, report. Go to the next slide. So why R2HE and SEPA, Right to Healthy Environment? R2HE is our short, our short form for Right to Healthy Environment. Um, so why in SEPA? Um, so although SEPA is designed to protect the environment and human health uh, from pollution and toxics, the Act does not currently recognize the interplay between healthy environment and the fulfillment of human rights. And I know Ryan spoke to this a little bit already. But um, I, I think it's I think it's well stated by the UN Human Rights Council in this in this quote that a safe, clean, healthy, sustainable environment is integral to the full enjoyment of a wide range of human rights, including the right to life, health, food, sanitation. Without a healthy environment, we are unable to fill our aspirations or even live at a level commensurate with minimum standards of digni human dignity. So really recognizing that environment and rights are very much linked together, and and it's time to. Uh, to move ahead with this with this commitment, and of course, the as Ryan has spoken to, the impacts of an unhealthy environment, if you want to put it that way, are most felt by um, by vulnerable populations or people in vulnerable situations, whether they be indigenous or racialized communities, low income communities. And there's plenty of evidence that shows that disproportionate impact. Next slide, and I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Um, you know, there was a study that came out about 10 years ago that showed that uh, um, uh, lower income uh, communities are, are three times more likely to live close to a, 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 a pollution emitting facility. And if you live close to a polluting emitting facility, um, there's lots of science showing that your you know, hospitalization, hospitalization rates, uh, 
um, hospitalization rates are higher for things like respiratory and circular diseases related largely to air pollution exposures. Um, communities, there's studies showing that communities near industrial, in industrialized areas have higher rates of cancer. Uh, we've seen the research that is kind of largely the East Coast about communities that are living near old waste landfill dumps and the and the environmental injustices or even environmental racism situations with, with many of them being African loyalist communities. Um, and then the uh, a recent UN uh, report from an expert um, uh, who traveled across Canada and visited many of these communities, many of these environmental injustices. And this is a quote from his report on the invisible violence inflicted by toxics as an insidious burden disproportionately borne by Indigenous people in Canada. So it's just some examples of, of findings with respect to environmental injustices, environmental racism in Canada. The picture I have here is a picture taken from Amjanong. Brian mentioned Amjanong. That's a community I've been to many times and have worked with. And, uh, and it's, a, it's an example of exactly what we're speaking about here, where you have uh, industrial facilities completely surrounding a community in a, and SIPA has really failed to do anything to, to alleviate the situation there. Go to the next slide. So just to talk about what environmental justice is, it is the fair and consistent distribution of environmental benefits or burdens without discrimination on the basis of grounds such as socioeconomic status, race, ethnic origin or residency on an Aboriginal reserve. And this is what we are, and when we talk about right to healthy environment, what we think will be one of the strengths of right to healthy environment is the ability to address or to obtain greater environmental justice. You can move to the next slide. I also want to talk about just the science and how that has evolved in 20 years since SEPA was last reviewed um, or strengthened. We know so much more about how toxics and pollution impact our health as well as our economy. Uh, 2017 study that estimated pollution costs tens of billions per year to the Canadian economy. Health Canada published this regular um, studies on air pollution and as their last one estimated 14,600 premature deaths per year in Canada related to exposure to health pollution and the health costs of 114 billion per year. So there's big economic numbers that um, behind uh, address, uh, lowering or addressing uh, pollution and toxic chemicals as well. Also biomonitoring studies, which are studies that look at chemicals in blood and urine, find nine out of 10 Canadians have endocrine disrupting chemicals in their bodies, including those often found in consumer products, everyday consumer products, whether they be bisphenol A or phthalates or perfluorinated compounds. And endocrine disruptors, which I'm sure some people have heard of are these low dose chemicals that have serious environmental health harms, uh, including things like decline fertility. And we're not just talking about women's fertility, also men's fertility. Uh, neurological disorders, as well as many other diseases. And this is just a picture of a book, which if you're interested in learning more about the threat of endoscripting chemicals, that you could look up and, and, uh, and read about it. And I think one of the, I just flagging this because right now with respect to the Canadian Environment Protection Act, which is our major legislation that does uh, um, regulate toxic substances, it does a very, very poor job of, of addressing this issue of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Next slide. So speaking of vulnerable populations, Health Canada did um, consult on a definition back in 2018, 2019 of vulnerable populations. And this is the definition that they consulted on. To my knowledge, they haven't finalized this, but we suspect that if a definition of vulnerable populations were to be included in SEPA, this is likely the definition that the government would end up using. And it recognizes those two different kind of areas of vulnerable populations that I spoke to, the, 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 the greater exposure. So I'm just gonna read it first, a group of individuals within general population who due to their greater susceptibility and or greater exposure may be at greater risk than the general population of experiencing adverse health effects from exposure to chemicals. So it recognizes the situation of uh, hotspot communities, for example, like when we mentioned the option on First Nation or communities near um, hazardous waste facilities or hazardous or polluting facilities or hazardous dumps would be kind of a greater exposure situation, but also recommends, also recognizes that susceptibility side of things where health impacts are not necessarily distributed equally. And some people have more susceptibility to exposures to pollution and toxic chemicals. We go to the next one. Um, so I did wanna just 
briefly touch on some of our other recommendations that are related to this issue of right to healthy environment and vulnerable populations, which are two of our primary recommendations. But in addition to that, and I think very much in line with strengthening SEPA and strengthening environmental rights in SEPA, we, we want to see quite a few changes to the way uh, toxic substances are regulated, including banning very highly hazardous substances like carcinogens and reproductive toxicants. Um, ensuring that SEPA starts to address cumulative effects of chemicals because people are not exposed to a single chemical at a time. In fact, we know that a typical day, you may be exposed to dozens of chemicals. Yet at, at present, the uh, SEPA tends to look at each chemical separately and individually um, for the most part, which is not going to provide real life protection. Um, and then also encouraging um, safer alternatives to when a substance is banned or, or restricted that it, that SEPA then turns to safer alternatives so we don't just have one nasty chemical substituting for another. I won't speak much about that because I think there's a future webinar on that issue. Um, we also want to see better disclosure of chemicals, uh, chemicals and products through labeling and enforceable air and national drinking water quality standards, which actually do not exist in Canada as one of the few um, developed nations in the world that doesn't have enforceable national air and, and drinking water quality standards. So there's some other recommendations and we'll get to the next slide. I think this is my concluding slide really is just to say, you know, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna amend SEPA to recognize right to healthy environment and include all these other recommendations that this needs to happen soon. So our call is for parliament to implement the standing committee's 2017 recommendations and pass legislation to strengthen SEPA that recognize the right to healthy environment without any further delay. Uh, and we'd like to see that done by December, 2020, which is only a couple of months away at this point. And this is to allow full time for full consideration and passage of a bill. Um, we have a government which is already a year into its mandate um, and it's a minority government. We don't know how long it's going to last. So our call out is the sooner the better. And we're looking for all federal parties to support a bill to bring SEPA into the 21st century. And thanks very much. And sorry about the confusion with my slides. <laughs> That's no problem. Thanks, Elaine. So Lisa, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and share your screen, we'll see if it's more cooperative for you. Give it a try. How's looks that? great. Yeah, that okay. looks great. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Gu. I work for the David Suzuki Foundation and um, have the Pleasure of collaborating closely with Elaine and colleagues from SELA as well um, on this and other, um, other issues. Um, I'm going to follow right on from Elaine's presentation um, just to provide you with a bit more details on what um, kind of the specifics of what of, of how we can um, envision environmental rights amendments in SEPA. A oh, few thought I couldn't advance my slides, but there we go. Um, so first of all, Elaine mentioned the um, Standing Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development. The House of Commons Committee uh, did review the act and issued, I think it was 87 recommendations for strengthening it back in 2017. And um, that report still really is a strong, is the strong basis for um, for the government's, or, sorry, I should say, we recommend that report as the basis for the government's consideration of an amendments package. So recommendations two to five in that report actually did address environmental rights and you sort of have them summarized in front of you there. Uh, but you'll see that the committee made recommendations um, to um, like really around more procedural rights in the act. Um, they also made recommendations for a preambulatory statement recognizing environmental rights, um, as well as uh, recommending that the government give consideration to other amendments throughout the other parts of the act that could be amended to recognize um, and really operationalize environmental rights. And finally, a series of, of um, 
of uh, corresponding amendments, I guess I could say. Um, we here I'm going to really kind of focus on um, the second and and third bullet here. Um, amending the preamble, I wanted to mention that uh, like this idea of a general statement recognizing environmental rights, or I think it was Ryan, Ryan, I think it was the first point in Ryan's um, three part explanation of what makes for legal recognition of meaningful environmental rights in law. And the first one is legal recognition. So the preamble is a place where, where we would look for just a statement recognizing the simple fact that Canadians have the right to a healthy environment. And um, many people are surprised to learn that we actually don't have that currently in any federal law. Um, I did want to just highlight that although the uh, conservative opposition members on the committee back in 2017 filed a dissenting report. They actually agreed with this part of the this recommendation to um, amend the SEPA preamble recognizing the right to a healthy environment. So that was really a, a unanimous recommendation from the committee back in 2017. Um, also, SEPA has a section of, of uh, duties in the administration of the act. And so that's another uh, uh, and forms another part of our amendments. Um, and we also are picking up on the, I also wanna pick up on the committee's recommendations around environmental rights amendments to the sections of the act dealing with assessment of risks of toxic substances. And it's really those assessment requirements under SEPA that drive um, the follow on regulatory action or risk management action um, for toxic, for substances assessed as toxic. And as we talk about these different places in the act where environmental that where SEPA could be strengthened within to recognize environmental rights, um, there's a, a ready parallel in the precautionary principle. A lot of people um, see the the incorporation of precaution in the 1999 makeover of SEPA, the last time this act was was debated by parliament two decades ago. Um, the incorporation of precaution was really uh, the sort of the new lens of the time. And we see the precautionary principle articulated in the SEPA preamble in the duties section. And then in part five, the, where addressing the assessment of risks from toxic substances, you can see there um, that there actually is a requirement for the ministers to apply the precautionary principle. And then outside the act, there's also been guidance developed um, in terms of how, what this means, uh, you know, like how to implement that requirement. And I, and I will say that, um, you know, the details of what is in that guidance is debated by, uh, by many of our organizations and that could be, and could be strengthened, but just to say that uh, this multi faceted incorporation of the precautionary principle has been quite, um, you know, there's broad agreement that this has been quite influential in Canada's approach to managing toxic substances under SEPA. And it has been influential because of the way that these different provisions operate together um, to first of all, uh, express a clear statement in principle and commitment um, and also include clear mandatory requirements um, and then with the implementation uh, framework set out as well. And so if we draw that parallel then to what we'd like to see uh, or how, what we could imagine for environmental rights in SEPA um, or what we might say like SEPA 2.0 here in 2020, uh, in parallel, we would like, we are looking for a general statement for the first time in Canadian law, uh, something along the lines there as whereas all people in Canada have the right to a healthy environment. And also that could that type of general statement needs to be transposed into the duties section of the act to include a duty for the minister to respect, protect and fulfill human rights or respect, protect and fulfill the human right to a healthy environment in the administration of the act. But that on its own is unlikely to be enough to drive real change in the way the act is, is implemented. So again, um, referencing the parallel to how the precautionary principle is treated in the act, we would like to see a parallel requirement 
um, to identify potential human rights impacts from substances as part of the assessment. Also, and Elaine already touched on this, so I won't go into further detail, but uh, provisions expressly addressing vulnerable populations um, and we do expect that there will be the need to develop outside legislative changes to develop implement uh, develop implementation guidelines, probably in consultation, and keep those updated as as um, best practice in this area evolves. One of the questions we've had to answer um, time and time again, and uh, which Elaine also touched on is, you know, SEPA itself is an act that sets out to protect human health and protect the environment. Um, so beyond that general statement on environmental rights, what would be different if, if SEPA required protection of the right to a healthy environment? Like what's, what, what is different beyond protecting health and the environment? And really the gap is there around environmental justice or what I've, how I've set it out here is that there's no requirement currently under the act to systematically assess adverse human rights impacts with a view to preventing them. Um, within the context of SEPA, adverse human rights impacts occur when risk management assessment and management actions fail to prevent threats or harm to human health and the environment that remove or reduce the ability of an individual to enjoy their human rights. Because as Ryan and Elaine set out, a healthy environment really is fundamental to the enjoyment of other human rights. And this is the missing, this is the missing link that environmental rights provisions could address within, within SEPA to ensure that all people benefit from the um, environmental protection measures that are put in place under the act. So actually, if you Google human rights impact assessment, I'm presenting this here as if it's some brand new idea. Actually, if you Google human rights impact assessment, you'll see um, some 700 million hits. Uh, it's a well actually developed, it's actually a well developed concept in the corporate sector, like corporate social responsibility um, thinkers and has had some attention from the UN as well in terms of just as systematically identifying um, uh, systematically identifying potential human rights impacts and even understanding um, to what extent the data is complete or incomplete to allow that assessment to proceed. Thinking about um, we, thinking about what this could, I guess, to try to put more of a point on what this could look like within SEPA, we've drawn from some of those resources and also the US Executive Order on Environmental Justice in place now for a couple of decades already. And the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, um, Ryan referenced Dr. David Boyd is, uh, holds that position currently. His predecessor, John Knox, published a report uh, for the UN, UN Human Rights Council that includes 16 framework principles for human rights and the environment. So drawing from these different sources and bringing them into the context of, considering them in the context of SEPA, we would see that requirements to integrate a human rights impact assessment under the act could include as a starting point, um, cons consideration of environmental justice. So would, uh, would a decision have discriminatory effects or would it help redress discrimination? Um, would, it, would a decision result in regression of environmental standards without scientific basis? Again, as I mentioned, the completeness of, of data for, on a, for effects on marginalized and vulnerable populations. Then the extent to which substances might impact the rights of those who are most vulnerable to the environmental harm and the potential needs for additional measures to protect those individuals' rights. Consistency with Canada's obligations to ind Indigenous peoples and cumulative health effects of substances that are assessed as a group or class to the extent that that data exists. So those are some of the elements that we could see um, being uh, further developed in an implementation framework. Um, if there were, and we would hope to see that proceed if there were a clear requirement under the act for uh, environmental rights considerations under SEPA or a requirement to incorporate human rights assessment uh, within the existing 
environmental and human health assessments uh, of, of toxic substances. Um, just before I close, I did want to draw your attention to um, a petition that's before the House of Commons right now. Well, it's open for signature actually for uh, until November 20th. This is petition E2758 and um, I'll post a link to it in the chat and perhaps that you would like to take a moment to sign it on the spot. Um, but there is a petition before the, before the House to move forward with amendment with legislation to modernize the Canadian Environmental Protection Act without delay um, and it includes the the specific recommendations that Elaine highlighted as well as recognition of the human right to a healthy environment. So that petition after it closes will trigger a requirement for the government to respond um, and we hope as Elaine said that the response will be uh, legislation by the end of the year to implement these provisions. Thank you very much and I will attempt to stop sharing my screen and look forward to participating in um, the discussion or answering any questions with the other panelists. Great, thank you, Lisa. So if I could ask Lisa, Elaine, Ryan, Faye and Joe to all unmute yourselves and turn your webcams on. I am just going to share our little closing slide here at the same time so people can see all of our information. Oh, except you can also now see all of my other tabs that are open. So I'm just going to change that up for a moment. Um, while I'm doing that, we had a few questions that came into the chat box. Um, before I read one out, I'll just mention, I know we had a few problems. I was managing them in the background with um, people's approval of their registration. We had some people join late. I suspect we had a few people who wanted to who weren't able to join. Um, we will definitely get that worked out. I will get on the phone with Zoom when we're done and figure out what happened. Uh, but we also are recording the session, so the whole session will get posted onto our website and will get emailed to everyone who is registered. So my apologies, you can pass my apologies along <laughs> to anyone who wasn't able to join or who had to join late. Um, so I'm seeing a question in the chat box here. Maybe we'll start with this one. SEPA is constitutional under the criminal law power. How does the government prove that vulnerable groups have been criminally injured by exposures to chemicals? I was waiting to see if Joe wanted to jump in on that one as the <laughs> lawyer. <laughs> oh. Joe, do we have you? Let's check and see if Joe's unmuted. That, that's quite a mouthful of a question. Can you all repeat it? Sure. The question was, SEPA is constitutional under the criminal law power. How does the government prove that vulnerable groups have been criminally injured by exposures to chemicals? Maybe I can jump in with some initial thoughts. Um, well. I think, um, see if I oh, there we go. That. Sorry, I was going to um, say, well, Joe uh, addresses his sound problems, but <laughs> we, we can hear you again. Sorry, can you hear me? Can yeah. you hear me? Oh, good. Okay. Um, you start, uh, SEPA starts with an, a, a, an administrative, not a criminal approach to chemicals. Uh, it makes a scientific investigation as to whether a chemical meets the, one or more of the tests under Section 64 uh, of the Act as being uh, toxic. And if it does, then the um, show is individual one, which is the list of. Joe, your sound is, is quite sketchy. Do you want to turn your webcam off and see if it helps your sound quality a bit? And maybe I'm going to throw it over to Lisa because we're definitely having trouble hearing Joe. Or I can take it too. I don't know. Sure. So yeah, yeah, so Joe is getting to the test under SEPA, which is in section 64. And it really is a test of what is considered a toxic substance and has an ecological and a human health side to it. 
Um, and then once the substance is found to be toxic, it is added to the schedule under Schedule 1 under SEPA, and then that allows the, the federal government to move ahead and regulate the risks. So what we're saying by regulate the risks of that toxic substance, whether it be to the environment or human health or both, what we're asking for with respect to vulnerable populations is that they do a better job of assessing those risks to vulnerable populations, whether they be uh, hotspot communities, whether they be people that are more vulnerable to chemical exposures, um, whether they be like, they don't even look at occupational exposures now, so whether it be occupational exposures. So the vulnerable populations piece is really about improving that assessment stage that happens that figure out whether a substance meets the, and it's done through a risk assessment, whether it meets the risk assessment, um, whether it meets the, the definition of toxic uh, under SEPA via risk assessment, and then uh, the follow the follow through to that would be then um, risk management with respect to the impacts on those vulnerable populations. So that's kind of I think where I'm not sure it's really answering the question directly, but that's how the two things are linked together, I guess, the assessment of toxic substance in vulnerable populations. Yeah, I know, and Lisa. just to add, I mean, the like actually the question, the question answers itself in a way, I mean, I guess that is that is a gap that we're pointing to that there isn't currently that clear requirement for consideration of vulnerable populations or, or human rights impacts more broadly in the assessment of, of substances. Um, and those assessments drive the approach to managing the risks as well. So the proposals that we are, um, we've been discussing today for strengthening SEPA with respect to new provisions, recognizing environmental rights and protections for vulnerable populations, don't fundamentally propose, don't propose to fundamentally change the legal underpinnings of SEPA, but rather set out this requirement um, mm -hmm. of, insert some specificity around the requirements for assessment within the you know general framework that's already set out under the act and often the situation in Canada is that um, in the absence of that clear requirement um, of any clear requirements for assessing risks to vulnerable populations or addressing human rights impacts more broadly we actually just lack the data to to demonstrate that so it's rarely the case where there's an assessment that you know identifies particular harm and then you know, blithely ignores it in the in the in the management approach. It's more often the case that it's just a big blind spot, right? Yeah. Um, and it's an and it's an intentional. I mean, not it's a willfully uh, a case of willful ignorance, if you will. Like because we don't require that type of an assessment, then we also don't generate that data, and then we don't see what we're missing, right? Um, so our um, hope is that this type of requirement would also drive better data collection to be able to. Um, better and understand impacts. Can I just want, make one more comment to that, which is uh, the fact that the, the government applies a, a risk-based approach is one of the limitations to be able to um, come to that conclusion uh, to deal with a vulnerable population. And I think one of the comments, a uh, very specific comment that Lisa made in her presentation was the lack of data. Um, the government under SEPA does have the ability to call for that data if they need it. Uh, but I think having the lens of vulnerable population and uh, requiring a specific uh, um, um, focus around an impact assessment um, uh, approach would lead to a better use of those kind of provision. Um, so it's not that they don't have the powers to collect that data, but they have they don't have the scope of range of issue um, uh, parameters that um, would lead to collecting that data from from those proponents that have the information available. And yeah, and what, one of the things we're saying too is that there are certain substances where they really shouldn't even need to do the risk assessment. Um, but that just the mere any any use or exposure to certain really highly hazardous substances should be enough to um, to trigger you know a prohibition or restrictions on those substances. And we're calling that kind of the high high hazard substance approach that we are pushing for, and we're hoping the government will adopt. Of course, we have no idea if they'll go that way, but. Um, you know, we, we, do, we do think that the, there is a case to be made that some substances you, you shouldn't even need to prove um, that they're mm. harmful or causing harm, that they're, they are so hazardous. Okay. And a question that came in um, right after that one, which uh, my chat box shows was from Faye, but I know wasn't, uh, keeping residential and industrial areas separated is imperative. Has there been any success on this anywhere? 
Um, no, the SEPA doesn't deal with the kind of local planning mm -hmm. level thing of things. So it's not, you know, I, I certainly some of the examples we see, such as, you know, the situation in Sarnia where you have people's homes basically directly abutting industrial facilities is something that is probably a, a, a situation that's an issue more of the past and would not probably be allowed to occur today if you were to have a new development, but it is a situation we need to address now. Um, because those situations do exist, but uh, SEPA is not really, it's not a, it's not a land use planning legislation that would happen on a local level of government. So it's not something that we can easily um, see being addressed through SEPA, except that SEPA could better regulate the chemicals that are impacting those communities that are directly beside any industrial facilities. That's the direction it would have to go to address that issue. I don't know if Faye or Lisa or Ryan want to jump in on that, but yeah, I would just, um, one comment I would just make is, you know, SEPA has um, done, uh, made progress on dealing with uh, industrial emissions rather than, you know, specifically focus at the residential level. Now, the challenge is that there are communities that are fence line, as um, um, both Elaine, um, the presentations from Elaine and Ryan had mentioned, and the need to deal with that. I think the other emerging issue and could be kind of relevant to the residential setting is that there's been a shift towards, you know, chemicals that have been found in many consumer products, right? So that the time is now to try to uh, deal with these emerging issues and approaches that SEPA hasn't handled quite well um, um, with the structure it has uh, currently, but needs to be much more refined uh, to take action on those uh, certain situations like hotspots. And maybe just to add, it's uh, at the risk of straying a little bit off topic, uh, people um, tuning in today might also be interested in a parallel initiative coming before the House of Commons. Um, it's Bill C-230. It's a private member's bill, an, uh, an act to redress environmental racism. Mm. I might not be getting the title of that exactly correct, but Bill uh, to, uh, C-230. Um, and it would require the government to, the Minister of Environment, I believe, to develop um, a strategy to redress, like to identify cases of environmental racism and redress and then report on that strategy to, or report on, on um, implementation of the strategy on a regular basis to Parliament. Um, so that's kind of a complementary measure that mm. uh, could potentially, um, if, if passed, could potentially address some of those issues. Interesting. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Uh, so we are at 203. We have, you know, about 10 minutes left and I'm seeing a few more questions come into the chat. Uh, one question that came up, Lisa, during your presentation says, I noticed the term cost effective in the preamble. The interpretation of this statement could be a very weak point as one would have to apply a complete accounting of monetary cost cradle to cradle, as they would no doubt not take into account any other type of cost. Does anyone know of anyone that has expertise in full cost accounting of projects or products? That is a, a kind of a, um, you know, could be a webinar in and of itself. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> um, and just to just to kind of point out, I think the, the reference was, I pointed to the preambulatory clause in SEPA related to the precautionary principle and it does indeed say that whereas the government of Canada is committed to implementing the precautionary principle that where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. Um, and yeah, others may want uh, to comment on the history of the inclusion of cost effectiveness in there. I certainly wasn't um, intending to uh, advocate for that exact language. I just reflecting the language that is in the act currently. Um, one thing about the preamble is that it is again, kind of a principled statement on these, on these points and not where the rubber hits the road. Um, so it is noteworthy that in the parallel to precaution, it's less, much less constrained in the operational uh, operative sections of the act. Well, particularly the requirement in part five uh, in line with the assessment of toxic substances or assessment of substances. Um, and I think we'd be looking for something similarly unconstrained related to environmental rights. Of course, that being said, of course, there are in, inevitably um, various factors to weigh in making decisions. And I think um, 
that's where the that's where the implementation guidance comes in um, to um, help specify how uh, how these how precaution um, environmental rights factors into um, other other to the to the within the context of a broader assessment. Okay. Did anyone else want to comment on that? I think it's just you know recognizing even even if you were talking about charter rights, my understanding is those are not absolute. There's always a balancing that occurs. So that is just something that we will always have to be addressing when we speak about um, environmental protection or environmental rights. That there's gonna be other factors that are gonna come into consideration in decision-making. Yeah, just um, to pick up from Elaine's point there, like even if there is a right to a healthy environment recognized in the Canadian charter, uh, there's also a provision of the charter that allows the government to infringe upon those rights if it can be justifiably upheld. Um, so again, it is a good thing, but there are limits to, to what can be done. Mm -hmm. So then I'll just point out to anyone who is hanging out in the chat box, uh, Lisa posted her petition at 1.52, and then at 2 o'clock there was another petition posted as well that people are welcome to have a look at. Uh, the next question that I'm seeing here uh, is a question for Ryan concerning three elements of rights. Under number two, information. What if there was willful withholding of information from a group of individual, students and parents, I assume this is an example, concerning failure of protocols that lead to breaches of asbestos and lead? Does that give you enough to understand um, the question, Ryan? Maybe you're reading it yourself as well. Yeah, yeah, this is the, the question from Toby. Um, just a point of clarification on the question. This is if the state was withholding information. Toby, if you want to unmute yourself and clarify your question, you're welcome to. Okay. Um, so I will admit to not knowing um, enough of the existing access to information provisions under SEPA to know what could be done now um, with a right to a healthy environment, um, depending on how the government instantiates this, uh, like with Norway's uh, Access to Environmental Information Act, I forget the title, um, but it could provide for mandatory releases of information. Um, the freedom of information requests are another way, but those are not satisfactory. Like this should be information no, that the, yeah, the government um, gives out in advance. They shouldn't have to be told to give it out. Um, yeah, I do think that a recognized right under SEPA would strengthen the, um, the information that the government has to give out to citizens, especially if there have been breaches or contaminations, um, certainly for something as serious as asbestos or lead. Um, what that looks like exactly, um, I, I, I can't say too much about that. Okay. I hope this was helpful. Okay, thank you. No, there, there was, uh, and Fee, I've had long convers conversations with Fee. There was a serious uh, breach within our high school, and this is why I'm asking questions. <laughs> Great, okay, thanks, Toby. Thank and you. we're including um, contact information, um, particularly for Faye, so if, if you wanted to follow up with us on that issue, I can talk thank to you about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, next, I believe this is a comment instead of a question from Olga. Not directly linked to SEPA, but still, I believe it is important to know that Canada has advocated for chemical recycling. There are concerns that having the Basel Convention recognize chemical recycling may open up more plastic waste to be traded free. That may have an impact on vulnerable populations, noting that chemical recycling facilities may be constructed close to residential areas. That's a good comment. Okay. Yeah. It, we really need to be thinking about these things as we move into this kind of circular economy thing about, you know, and I know I've heard Faye talk about this quite a bit about the impacts of chem of plastic recycling, chemical recycling, and mm -hmm. it's a, it's a complicated issue. And that's a really good point from Olga. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next question. How are we doing in time? We'll answer this one. Maybe time for one more. We'll see how complex it is. Uh, the Swedish chemical agency KEMI has operationalized the precautionary principle with the substitution principle, the concept that if there are inherently safer options that they should gain the market. 
How is this concept captured under your recommendations? This happens piecemeal with consumer pressure, but only late in the day. Anyone want to comment on that question? I don't know, Faye, do you want to jump in on that one? Because I think uh, Sila has probably done the most work on safer substitution. I can speak to what yeah. we've recommended, but. Right, I think it's related to, to that, Elaine. Uh, and I think um, one of the provisions that we'd like to see under uh, changes to SEPA is requiring a mandatory requirement for um, informed substitution, right? Alter, um, through an alternative assessment approach, uh, which requ would require the government to undertake a process to evaluate the availability of, uh, of alternatives that do not um, pose the same type of hazards or toxicity uh, that is intended to replace the chemical that um, possesses those um, properties. Um, so it does require the need for a mandatory requirement. Um, the idea is to create uh, a preventative um, objective um, to that requirement um, and eventually lead to the elimination of the worst um, chemicals. And we could start off, the, the amendments that we had proposed was to start off with the list that's considered um, the schedule one, uh, the CEPA toxic list as a starting point. But there are many others. Uh, the process takes uh, um, to regulate them in the current uh, framework is pretty intense in terms of time frame um, and process. Um, but this one does require some obligations for the federal government um, if, if incorporated into CEPA um, to undertake that kind of evaluation of, of the alternatives available. To particular substances. And I think what we've heard from experts too is that unless there's a regulatory requirement, this is unlikely to happen on its own. So it really needs to be something that is required or triggered under SEPA. Absolutely. And I'll just point to one other thing which um, we've announced, you know, webinar two and webinar three to some degree um, uh, over the next two weeks, which will probably touch on this uh, particular topic around finding alternatives, the importance of doing that. Um, and particularly as it pertains to uh, protecting the vulnerable groups, right? There's justification to, to make that link um, to the discussions that we're having today and to the validity of, um, of certain um, vulnerable groups, including children and workers uh, that uh, you know, um, experience higher than a normal uh, risk factors to um, exposure to many chemicals that are in the market today. Okay. Great. So that actually very nicely brings us to the end of the questions that I see in the chat box. And given that we're almost at 2.15, uh, I think we will end there. But before we let everyone go, just a couple of quick things I want to drop into the chat box. Um, first up is a link to our webinar evaluation. So if you have a moment to fill that out, also gives you an opportunity to give us your name and email address if you want to stay engaged in future conversations on this topic. Um, registration for the next two sessions. If you didn't already register for all of them all at once, you can go to our website and sign up for the next two. We will be working out some kinks in the system, obviously, based on today, but we'll get that all lined up before next week. And then also on the screen, Faye has put up um, a link to a document on SELA's website about SEPA amendments. So I'll give you that link there as well. And the very last thing, if you haven't done enough clicking, is a link to our bulletin. So if you wanna pop onto SEAL's website and sign up for our bulletin so you can find out about future opportunities like this and hear about all of the work that we're doing. So I think with that, I will say a big thank you to Lisa and Elaine and Ryan for speaking today, to Faye for organizing uh, and to all of you for attending today and sticking with us up until 2.15. Hope you found the content uh, helpful today and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.